Hello, this is Rick Moore from White Cap Publications. I'm interviewing um, author Eric DiCarlo on his new book, The Cold, right? Oh, it's yes, a, indeed. But congratulations on your new book, The Cold. It's oh. an, an intriguing read. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. This 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 one was from the heart. This is this is my uh oh, I don't know, James Joyce's Ulysses or something. It's you know, <laughs> this is just well, it's, a, it's a remarkable book, truly remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. There was there was no compromise in this whatsoever. I swung for the fences and <laughs> the results do or do not speak for themselves. I'll leave that up to the reader. <laughs> All right, let's get into it, shall we? Yes. Um Describe, if you will, the setup when your character sees the cold for the first time. Uh, well, the main character is a 40-year-old um, male who, uh, in this world, people are divided into either you're old and, and you're like us, you're a regular human being with uh, a normal emotional structure, or you're a cold, which is uh, someone who has been born completely without emotions. And the cutoff has been absolute. It happened when this guy was 20 years old. Now he's 40. So there's been 20 years of planet Earth divided into olds who are now aging out of the population and colds who are coming in and they've been around for 20 years. So there's 20 years worth of uh, colds uh, hanging around. So the main guy, Kyle Norris, is an executive in San Francisco. Uh, right. Right. And he spots a bike messenger because uh, this kind of profession still exists. Um, and it's a it's a young woman. It's a, she looks like she's 20. So she could be either an old or a cold. She's probably a cold because old, an old would not take this kind of job anymore. And he's just entranced by her. Um, just finds her physically striking. You know, the dude's 40. I mean, come on, you know, midlife crisis is <laughs> just over the horizon. And he's, you know, oh, boy, look at that hot woman. And there are no, you know, there's nobody young anymore who is an old, who is an emotional creature like he is that he could relate to in a normal, sensible uh, fashion. So he fixates on this girl who is probably a cold and she does turn out to be just that. But she's almost like, um, uh, I guess the metaphor would be, she's almost like a pornographic fantasy to him. It's like, oh, look at this hot, absolutely unreachable being. Oh, my God. And she's just amazing. So this is, you know, she's she starts out as just a picture in his mind, but he fixates on her. And since they're both in San Francisco and they're both downtown, he sees her periodically. He goes out on his lunch break and he scouts for her because she's like like any good bike messenger. She's all over the financial district. And when he sees her, he just becomes more and more obsessed with her. And a plan starts hatching in his head in his head to how how could I how could I have a relationship with this young, really hot looking uh person? You know, I mean, not that she's <laughs> utterly beautiful or anything like that. She's just 20 years younger than him. And he's like, wow, look at that. And that's how it starts for him. It's now, just, perhaps it's, we should tell the audience what a cold is. Well, a cold, an old is. Yeah. A, a cold is someone born entirely without the ability to generate emotion. They're human beings in every other way, physiologically, uh, biochemically. But there is something absent either from their brain or their heart or their soul, whichever, you know, poetic... Uh, um, metaphor works for you um but they just they they don't have emotions and and the spooky spooky thing about it is that there is no explanation as to why this just happens out of the blue it's all it's almost like an act of god and it happens all at once one day human beings are being born like they've been throughout our entire history and prehistory and then bam it's over and nobody is being born with emotions anymore and there's nothing anybody can do about it. That's that's the other super spooky thing about it is there's no there's no fix on the horizon. Uh, science or medicine is not going to come in and say, oh, well, there's something wrong with the brain here. We just have to flip this uh, cerebral switch here and everybody will be fine again. No, 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 no. They're done. There's no there's going to be no more human beings born with the emotions that we simply take for granted. I mean, this isn't, you know, 
this isn't a mental apparition of where uh you know somebody's somebody's on the the whole world is suddenly on the spectrum it's no they the entire mechanism of emotional generation is just absent so you have beings who you know they need to eat and they need to sleep and uh they have survival instincts you know they don't they don't pick up fire they don't walk out into traffic they want to live in the sense that everything alive wants to live in the sense that uh, you know an ant will flee from you if you're holding a can of raid and it can figure out well what what you're doing um so, so those are the cults and you know they're they're piling up now there's 20 years worth of them like i said right and um, and eventually and you know this is the uh the just gruesome truth about it is they'll keep breeding and if humans old breed if they if they have a child they have a cold child if two colds breed they have a cold child. If it's a mixed couple, they will have a cold child too. So eventually the human race is going to go extinct as far as being capable of having emotions. And this sinister generation is going to come up behind us all and we'll just be pushed off the board and it'll be left to them to make what what of the worlds they wish, now if they have any desires. That's a really appalling thought, right? Yeah, it's it's one. I if 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 I had read this, that would be one that would haunt me. I would just I would be thinking right. about that. Like, wow, right. what would that be like? Yeah, yeah. Now you're right. I know the streets, the buildings, the cracks and crumbles. St streets need repaving. Sometimes they get repaved, but there is a lot less hot tar work like that going on in this precinct than oh, yeah. even five years ago. No less uh, the need for the repairs and the upcakes, but the effort, the simple will. Is perhaps not so easily mustered anymore. Oh. Is this a result of the cold's apathy? Are the colds really apathetic? Or I understand they have no emotion, but does that translate to apathy? Well, no, no, it's it's not the colds who are apathetic. The colds are from, you know, a month old to 20 years old. So they're not really in charge of anything. Ah. It's the olds who still are have the responsibility and the onus of maintaining the infrastructure of the cities and governments. You know, they have to keep the hospitals running. They have to keep the police force, you know, stocked. But the will of the olds to maintain their own environment is slipping as their numbers are starting to slip, you know? They're starting to age. They're 20 years and up now, but you know, five years from now, they're gonna be 25 and up and people are getting older. And so they look around and they're like, Oh uh, yeah, we need to repave this street, but let's let's put that on the back burner for now. Or you know, I was gonna open a a business, like you know, or I was gonna take over my parents' business, but uh, you know, I don't think I'm gonna bother now. Why? What is the point? I'm not gonna be able to pass on a legacy to anybody. My right. if I have a child, it's gonna be a cold child. You know, they're not going to be interested in you know part partaking in anything that resembles my life. So there's this sense of kind of sweeping apathy. No, not apathy. It's more, it's a malaise. A malaise has kind of overtaken the earth and the olds are just, they're just watching the clock run out now, which is, you know, kind of how I feel sometimes, you know. You, so you they get, have you, less interest in, in the world unwinding? Well, you world get- Structure? Well, you get, you get older and you see that, uh, you know, time is starting to run out it's like oh well you know you just look at you look at your life right. and you look at the calendar and you go like oh i've got less years to live than i've already lived yeah i mean that's just you know that's plain fact you know right. live with that that's right. that's just how it is but if it were on a deeper and more profound level and if the um if the environment in which you were living was much more sinister which it would be with the colds right where you you can't even you can't even justifiably hate the colds, but they are definitely other. They are, you know, you cannot, you can't relate to them. You can't, you can't really take an interest in them. You can't figure them out because they're just, they're just a uh, motorized survival instinct, which I think is how well, Romero brings up another interesting said about zombies. I'm yeah, sorry, what's really? that? <laughs> that brings up another interesting point. Yes. In comparison to zombies is, Kind of peculiar, but it's apt. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of. You also write that they are, in fact, outside so many of the strictures 
which fenced me in during my adolescence, that mm. some part of me envies them. Now, does this imply a certain pigeonholing of the cause? Does this mean that humanity, as dwindling masters of the world, have just given up on teaching cold to do anything? Or does it mean that the Coles are simply uninterested in the world around him? Does lack of emotion necessarily imply lack of interest? Oh, ooh, good, juicy question. Well, what happens is that when the Coles start being born, it is, of course, a massive worldwide crisis and people go insane. Uh, oh, my God, you know, when they figure out, oh, these children, they're they're not reacting like a child should be reacting. And it's happening with every single child that's being born. You know, what What? what God's name is going on? This is insane. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, you have parents would be rejecting their children. They're like, you know, this is this is not my baby. This is almost like a changeling. This is something that's been put in the crib that, you know, I was expecting to have a, you know, a baby that at least had uh, the beginning um of roots of emotion that you know i could relate to the it's it's not even like i this never thought of how the parents would react to colds oh yeah yeah and that's that's the thing it's like they would the children would be you know unwanted uh they would you know you'd have a generation of foundlings just all of a sudden so what i had were uh institutions kind of these crummy um complexes where they would just warehouse the babies like, and you know people would take care of them the way that they would take care almost of livestock oh, and wow. you know they'd be fed and they would be clothed but they don't need anything i mean they don't need to be played with they don't need you know interaction for their emotional health because they don't have right. any emotions they don't need that but uh the idea of education i um i came up with okay so you would be housing all these um young children well, how how would you teach them anything? And I thought, well, they would they could just put on like there would be automated tapes. There would well not tapes, you know, tape doesn't exist anymore, and that tells you how <laughs> old I am. But there would be these automated programs that would play in the dormitories or in the cells or wherever they're wherever they're housed, where if the cold was inclined, could learn how to read just from looking at the wall. Because it would be these would be these teaching programs that would probably just play on a loop and they'd be able to communicate the basic um, ideas of, you know, OK, this is this is how you read. You know, this is this is how you speak. I think you could teach children who have no emotions, who have no tantrums, who have, you know, they, they don't act out because they they don't act out. You could probably teach a whole generation um of kids that way and so be scientists or something like that right you don't yeah have emotion because well science is typically thought of as emotionless mm -hmm. but um so it'd be suitable for the colds or math or something like that but well they, taking menial jobs don't they yeah well they don't seem to have um uh, like the motivation to go into a career or a field, you know, the, you know, what, what do we need science for? You know, right, right. We, can, we can just breathe the air. We know how to, we can figure out how crops are made. You know, their needs are very uh, small. It's really just, you know, what do we need to survive? It's not what do we need to be comfortable with or what is going to strike my fancy or anything like that. It's, um, it's just, you know, how can how can I live through the day? It's almost it's almost like an animal instinct. You know, you're just trying to live through live through the night until, you know, until right. the sun comes up and you can be safe again. So they don't you know, they're not aspiring to be anything. They're just and this is another great sinister bit of the thing is that they just seem to be waiting. They just seem to be waiting it out. Let the olds all die, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do. And the main character, Kyle Norris, speculates on this and everything else. It's fair. It's a very introverted book where he's, you know, dissecting and trying to figure the whole thing that's, out. But he, that's he, a fairly he, creepy thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and he wonders, you know, what kind of society are they going to make? Are they even going to have an economy? You know, and like, well, yeah. why would they? Why would they need money? And but the old society is still in place, rocky as it is, 
as malaise ridden as it is, like I mentioned, it's still the governing uh, system that's holding the world in thrall. And so the olds just plug themselves in in the easiest way they can. It's like, oh, OK, you need a you need uh, somebody to mop the floor. I'll do that for this amount of money so that I can pay the rent on this place. But once all you old people are wiped out, maybe we won't even have rent. In fact, we probably will not have rent. We probably will not have a system that's anything like ours. It won't be imaginative. It won't be utopian, but it'll lack all the ambitious competitiveness that, you know, we just suffer through on a daily basis and think, oh, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I run out of money, then I'm going to starve on the street. Yeah, that's that's right. fine. Well, the importance is they left behind, right? They would leave yeah. behind. Yeah. Now, well, you describe the, an old man who sees the young colds, uh, two colds on the street. Oh, yeah. That's badly to them. And you have yeah. a riveting description of it. It's really riveting. A shambling gate full of the miseries of age, bloodless hands clenched into fists at his sides. Oh. But... What specifically is the old man angry at? The very existence of the coals or his own upcoming death with no one left behind who cares that he lives? Oh, uh, he probably hasn't thought it through to that latter extent, although that's a really good insight right there. Um, yeah, that's like the second just mini chapter in the thing, if I'm remembering correctly. It takes place in Union Square in uh, San Francisco. And it's just, it, it's the idea that... Um, there would be it, there would be anger against the colds, but it wouldn't really be justifiable anger. It would be this, you know, it's almost like, how dare you, God? How dare you, fate, to have done this to us? I hate that you've right. taken away, you know, our society and you've given us these creatures instead. So there would be a lot of enmity towards uh, the colds. And this particular old man, it was it was it was the idea that. His age would uh, exacerbate his animosity, his kind of I thought automatic that was animosity. Particularly fascinating that you had an officer curtail the old man. Yeah, yeah, I had I, yeah. really um, an odd thing to do. I mean, it, obviously the officers are no old, right? Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. It's a it's a female officer, as I recall. You know, although yep, if it yep. was a male That's officer, would I say right. male officer? I don't know. We all need you to said female themselves. officer. You said female yeah. officer. Right. Uh, but that would almost be like uh, if if you had beat cops again, that would almost be job number one. Keep the olds from beating up on the colds. I mean, that would just be like, oh, you got to do this every day. This is just right. this is, you know, instead of handling drunks, you're like, hey, leave the <laughs> leave the cold alone. It didn't do anything to you, buddy. Move along. Right. So, right. You know, that's why that's why I don't make a big deal out of it. That's why almost the. The casualness of the old man's um, uh, anger. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, impulse toward violence, you know, actual violence toward these children and the way that it's just cleaned up in a kind of cursory, you know, OK, all right, Grandpa, knock it off. It, but that still is a riveting description. Oh, I, thank you. There's a wonderful description. Now, you say that, um, say, Kyle Norris, age 40, is your main protagonist, right? Yes. He seems, from your description of him, to have difficulty relating to the world now mm. that the colds have arrived, right? You yeah. say he, I think it's really fascinating, too, you say he watched the arrival of the colds with all its slow-motion horror. That's a really uh, excellent you. description. Thank you. And, Thank you. But I get the impression that he was drifting through his life long before the coming of the colds. And the coming of the colds were, it was more like a confirmation that the world was doomed. Is that really the case? Was Kyle really waiting for such an event to awaken his long dormant self? That feeling of his impending death. Well, that's great, man. Boy, I hope they teach this in school one day so they can have this very conversation, you know, <laughs> in a classroom setting. Um, Kyle is, uh, he he's an old and he has... He has a perfectly intact emotional structure, but he's just a little removed and aloof. I mean, he's not, you know, he's not on the spectrum. He doesn't have any mental nope, disabilities. Nope. He's just kind of a little bit removed from things, like a half square off where everybody else is. And he's keenly, well, he's not keenly aware of it, but he's he's aware of it even before the colds arrive. And it's right. like 
I wonder why I don't, you know, why don't why don't I burst into tears like, you know, people seem to do? Why why do I keep this certain amount of reservation? Is it just a is it a instinct or dignity or do I not quite have the fully activated equipment that so many other people seem to have? But when the colds come along, it's almost like what he's been experiencing in his life is suddenly writ large and it's apocalyptic and it's so big and overwhelming that he just he looks at it and he's just amazed and in awe that, you know, something that he had a just a tiny seed of within himself has bloomed into this, you know, horrible circumstance of actual emotionless people who are never going to go away and who are going to outbreed the rest of the human race. It, this isn't anything that he would be consciously waiting for. He's not he's not fatalistic to the sense of waiting for the sky to fall every day, but it does not entirely, entirely surprise him. He adjusts to it relatively quickly because it's almost just like, well, this is the way it is. This is how the world is now. And he can, uh, it, it's not that he can quite see where they're coming from because the cold aren't coming from anywhere. You know, they're just, they're just there. But he sees a certain very, very distant kinship with them, which is probably part of what motivates him to but do you manufacture think, a relationship with the girl. But do you think that event, the coming of the colds, triggered him in some way? Like um, he was waiting for something to happen because if nothing happened, nothing dramatic happened, he would go through his life feeling half a man or a quarter, three quarters of a man or something, because he's always, um, he didn't feel the emotions that mm. people want. So when the colds were born with no emotions, did that trigger him to his awareness of his relationship to other men or what women? Well, you know, in, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Um, right, right. Um, that's probably a good percentage right there, where he's three quarters feeling like he's actually involved in a uh, in a convincing way with with his life emotionally and, and with right. the world. But when the colds come along, then it kind of resets everything. And that, that could be like an awakening for him where it's almost like, well, I was always vaguely thinking something bad might happen, but now the worst possible thing has come about. And it's almost like he's just a little bit better prepared than other people. Because the life that he leads in the story when you start off is like, right. well, he's got a good job. He's got a nice place to live. He doesn't have to worry about money per se. And, you know, he's got a very comfortable living despite the fact that the world is just, you know, sliding off the table into the abyss and he's going to go with it. But he doesn't real, really feel connected, does he? No, he's he's um, he's a little bit isolated. Um there's an early tragedy in his life that the book eventually circles great. around and touches on. And that that's I a really that. great touch, by the way, oh, a really great touch. That was harrowing to write. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but he's got that in his life and you know, who doesn't have horrible things that have happened to them with, you know, with, uh, early romantic outings and, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's life yep. is rotten. You know, we all know that. Uh, <laughs> uh but you know, when that when that happens to him, it kind of removes him a little bit from the human race, just just a little bit. I mean, he's not he, he's not somebody that you would look at and think, oh, this guy's just checked out of society. He's not right. even really right. part of the human race. He's just a little bit. He's, he's the guy at the party who's reserved. He has interesting things to say, but he doesn't blurt things out. He just he's more he's just watching what happens and taking in the information and, you know, strategically um, uh, participating in, in life uh, where he's not going to get hurt in any real way. Like the relationships that he that he has before the girl comes along are just these kind of, you know, they're just tossed yeah. off sort of affairs that, you know, don't mean anything to him or to the other person. And that's fine because that's, that's the way the world, I believe, would be like that where, you know, you wouldn't be looking for your true love. You'd just be looking for somebody to kill time with. All right. Well, you describe um, everyone that is not a cold as an old, right? Yes. And, which is an apt description given the way the story unfolds, right? Yes. But don't they harbor a secret hope that the colds are an anomaly 
which was soon corrected. Isn't this why they isolate the group uh -oh. from the rest of humanity? And you're right that this does not, of course, happen. Does the old man or people in general um, still harbor this hope? Or is his anger and frustration directed at the hopelessness of the situation? There seems to be no solution in sight. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, that that is a wonderful can of worms right there. Uh, the premise of the thing, um, one of the things that almost makes this a grimdark story, and grimdark is just, you know, emotionally disconnected. Usually it's sword and sorcery stuff where you right. can just kill off characters right and left, and there's no moral, you know, structure to it really whatsoever. But, but in this case, there is a moral structure. Yeah, yes, yes, there is. But uh, the where I say that it touches on a grim, dark kind of feel is that there's no solution. This is not going to get right. cured. And, and people, the old, have given up on the idea collectively. Right. Just, just en masse. It's just, oh, it's... We're, we're not going to figure this thing out. There's no solution coming over the horizon. There's no cavalry. The scientists aren't going to figure this out. Right. This is a done deal, and we are just going to have to live with it. Now, it's not every single last person, so you still, I think I make mention at some point, you still have olds who are breeding and still thinking, you know, hoping against hope that, oh, maybe our this. child yes. will be yep. the one that will be born with emotion. But you just go into that in the book, right? You do yeah, that. yeah, it just it, in in passing, in I mentioned that kind of thing. But the, the idea is that it's just, it's just done. It's just over. It's like the bit in the movie On the Beach where the Australians know that the radiation is coming and when they, they try to do something about it and they send a submarine mission to see if they can... You know, there's some place safe where they can live. And then they realize that, no, it can't be stopped. The radiation from World War III is going to come drifting down from the northern hemisphere. And everybody in this final continent where humanity is, is going to die. And like the last, I don't know, 40 minutes of the movie are just these people dealing with it and accepting it to the best of their ability. And it's, I wanted to get that feeling of just kind of like, ah. Oh. Right, <laughs> right. So that brings just... up another point, right? Yes. But Kyle doesn't seem to uh, feel this way. He seems to have developed a passive uh, acceptance of the situation. Mm -hmm. And you're right. And I think this is really uh, a great line. When the fact of the cold phenomenon was first established, Amidst that ultra potent, that ultra potent wave of shock and disbelief, one positive effort emerged from the mayhem: find the last human child born. This is a fascinating concept. Now, yes. yes, other less far less constructive activities were undertaken as well. Daycare centers were firebombed. Pregnant women were hacked apart on the streets of Calcutta, Christchurch, Jersey City. These were indeed atrocities. Now, in all this, observing all this. Kyle seems as emotionless about it as the colds. His acceptance of that is the same as his acceptance of the colds. And what developments in his life led him to feel this way? Well, he would have had a more visceral reaction when these things were actually actually taking place. The atrocities that I, I right. mentioned there are things that happen early on when the cold phenomenon is discovered when they make efforts to try and stop it realize they can't stop it and then people really lose their minds and so they're one of the reactions would be i think would honestly be oh we need to kill these children so you know you see a pregnant woman and yeah you go at her with a machete you know just i mean i'm sure religion would figure into it in a big way too it would be frenzy and hysteria and it would just be this horrible thing so when this was going on kyle would have had more of a you know reasonable recognizable human but the way he accepted it was really uh, the same way as he accepted the colds right yes yeah the existence it's of cold and the atrocities that followed two yeah. separate instances but both of them he uh, developed a certain numbness to them, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, reacting to human, uh, horrible human, uh, overly emotional behavior and completely unemotional behavior. Because there was nothing he could do about it, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, he, he is as helpless as everyone else. And he just, right. you know, he's come to a conclusion in his mind that all all I can do is just ride this out in the best comfort I possibly can. Well, that's so. one of your interesting insights. Mm. 
his embracing of the ultimate hopelessness of the situation of life, the colds, where he can't do anything about it. So he might as well yeah. accept it. And the atrocities, he can't do anything about them, so he must accept them. Yes. Right. But yeah, and the the only the effort that he makes and the whole point of the book is that what he does to fight back against all of this, against the against the coming of the cold and the extinction of the human race, is he tries to manufacture a recognizably emotional relationship with a cold, even though this cannot possibly happen. Right. She will never feel anything for him. But what if, what if? He can feel something for her. That would be a kind of profound victory for him, he, where he, he he's almost overcoming the apocalypse right. by by doing this, and he's redeeming himself in the sense of, well, I had emotions all along. I actually really can feel. But of course, when he sets out into the venture, he's just thinking, boy, hot twenty-year-old, and this this will be great. I'll pay her, and she'll come live in my place, and we'll have sex all the time. It, right. It'll be great. And then gradually, he starts to feel for her. But but that becomes that becomes his mission. That becomes his way of fighting back against a situation where you well, cannot possibly win. Doesn't he impute his feelings for her to her having some feelings for him? Well, he wants that to be true. Yes, but he does through, want that. Yes, but throughout, th this is a very self-aware guy. This is a guy who is definitely not living the unexamined right. life. He is, you know, he's in his head all the time. He's very introspective. He's he's watching things in a in you know a very clinical way, and um, he wants her to feel stuff. But he knows, and he knows right to the end that she never will. And he becomes almost OK with that. They have a physical relationship that he finds very satisfying. And believe it or not, she finds very satisfying, too, because, you know, the colds are still physical beings. And I think the line that she says um, that kind of cracks the code on the thing just sums it up beautifully. I even used it in the in the original short story. And she just says sex is necessary. Yep. You know, it's almost like an intake of food. It's just like. Oh, so yeah, you're emotionless, but your body is not without um, needs and wants uh, that would. And I got one question for you, and I yeah, think the please. people that read your book would really get into this, right? Why, with uh, Kyle having feelings for her and recognizing what they are, right? Mm -hmm. And she doesn't have any feelings for him, but she goes along with it, right? What led him to discontinue the relationship? Oh, oh, that that's good. Um, um, well, he sets it for a month. He tells himself, you know, I'm basically going to purchase this girl for one month's time, and we're going to have a faux shadow relationship that'll be physical, and maybe I can pretend it's something more. And of course, this is an absolute creep move. Let me. Let me make this perfectly clear. Right, this right, this right. is about yes. as romantic as Lolita. It's <laughs> you know, yeah, it's it's not supposed to be wholesome in in any way, shape, or form. Yep. But he's you know uh, he instigates uh, the relationship with her uh, to, to try and um, you know awaken something in in himself. Um, hit, hit, hit me one more time with the gist of the question. Sorry, I was well, going down. Sideways. Well, all right. Uh, since he has this relationship with her, right? There, where he cares for her, he develops feeling. First, it starts out as pure lust, right? Yes. And then he develops feelings for her, right? And she doesn't have any feelings for him that matches, develop. She has no interest in his lust, and she, just as she has no interest in his feelings, right? Right. So, why did uh, Kyle discontinue the relationship oh, instead yeah. of continuing the relationship? I I'm sorry, I got lost in my own head. That's okay, that's okay. Yeah, so he basically sets the timer for uh, one month, one. and he tells himself in a kind of disciplined way, all right, you can have your fun for one month. You're going to pay her rent on her place. She's going to come live with you, and that's why she agrees to it, because she can get ahead a little bit uh, financially by, by doing this. It, there's no emotional onus for her giving up her body to this person who's not abusing her, who is not, you know, 
you know, he's not going to take her home and, and beat her up or anything like that. There's no right. There's, right. there's no hint of that in in an, in any way. But he tells himself in a kind of self-disciplined way. It's like, OK, you can have this, but you can only have this for so long, because when the month is up, she's not going to feel anything more for you than she feels from the outset. And if you keep doing this, you're just going to self-destruct. You're, you're going to destroy yourself because you'll find a way of thinking that this is a real relationship and it'll just, it'll kill you. But if you do it for a month, you can have all the fun you want and you can find out whatever you need to find out about yourself, but have, have the decency to cut it off when it's done. But Maybe she, she doesn't need respect, but you can respect her anyway and say, okay, you're free. From her point of view though, she was willing to continue the relationship. Sure. The relationship I'm, didn't diminish in any way, right? Ah, get another so month out of it. He wasn't really respecting her so much mm. as he was recognizing the hopelessness of his situation. Like um, the hopelessness of the colds, the hopelessness yes. of the violence and atrocities that occurred, right? Mm. So in some method, some way, he was realizing his own death, his own mm. mortality. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, that's 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 a really good uh, read into it. It's 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 the helplessness that he can't he can't get past and nobody can get past. So he's almost right. like it's almost like he's making a little two handed play out of this thing with him and the woman. And he's reconciling for himself the terrible thing that has happened to his kind, to the old, to the human race, which has produced, you know, great bits of art that's going to be lost forever. And it's almost like this way he can sort of put it to bed and, and say- almost, In a way, he was recognizing and preventing his own um, disintegration. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, with a uh, aging man, which he was, 40 years old, yeah, and he, he continued the relationship he would uh, feel less and less and less of a man because he realized uh, early on that she didn't love him. But yeah. still, there's got to be that draw for her, you know? Oh, for an yeah. older man, a younger woman, there's yes. got to be that draw for her. But he recognized his own self-awareness, right? Mm -hmm. So that he recognized that he would disintegrate as a man. Yes, yeah. and it, it, it's very painful when he um is good to his word and says okay the month's up you know we're done i'm gonna i'm right. gonna drive you home and we're out and she's like well let me stay and he's and he somehow he is able to like no 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 this is done but now why do you think he was able to do that because self-discipline isn't uh really um an explanation you yeah. know you can say self-discipline but there's got to be an underlying motif for that oh, yeah right? yeah well the thing is is almost unbeknownst to him the relationship changes him even uh -huh. though it's not, even though it's not really a relationship even right, though it's right. this kind of pantomime um he's still having his half of the emotional involvement and that is reaching to him and he's able to almost reconcile the tragedy that happened to him when he was much younger just before the colds no that's had, an interesting arrived. take that's an interesting take that's a very yeah. deep take well, and I mean, he he is a different character, like the penultimate chapter. I don't want to spoil this for anybody, but, no, no. <laughs> you know, he he commits an act after when the girl is gone. He commits an act that he would not right. otherwise have done before her advent. So he has been changed by her presence, even though she hasn't done anything to actually from her end to reach his heart. His heart has been touched anyway, even if it's this, you know, kind of sad echo chamber of, you know, emotionality that that he's existing in. Oh, it just just that, chills me to the bone. Man. That does. That does. <laughs> now, does. Um, Eric, um, let's see. We can get your book on Amazon and Barnes mm -hmm. and Noble everywhere. The books are available. Oh, it's hot cold dog. The cold. It's called the cold. And um, it's uh, by White Cat Publications. But uh, can I interview you next weekend? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's do this until time Good. stops. I enjoy this quite a bit. <laughs> All right, man. I'll see you later. And okay. Everybody get his book and, and read it through because it's really, really worth the read. I appreciate that. Always a pleasure right. to talk to you. All right. All right.